Hi, I'm DJ Ware. On this episode of the Cyber Gizmo, we're going to talk about a very special birthday for Linux right after this. Linux is fast approaching its 30 years of being around. And so that's what I wanted to talk to you about today was the 30 years of Linux. So let's just dive in here. So <clears throat> as of this video, let's talk about Linux as to where it is right now. So as I'm doing this video right now, uh, the Linux kernel 5.14 release candidate 5 has been released. In the stability platform, Linux 5.13.9 has been released. And our current uh, long-term stability release is 5.10.57, or the patch level of 5.10. But as of last year, over a million software commits had been performed on the Linux kernel alone. And the Linux kernel remains the largest, most successful open source project in existence. So uh, there's no, no doubt about that. They are definitely uh, the largest one that's out there. So where did it come from? Well, we kind of all know that, right? So Linux, uh, the first release uh, of uh, 0.01.tar.z, that would be the tar file, was released on September the 17th of 1991. It consisted of 88 files, so not very much, and a little over 10,230 lines of code. And it only ran on a single architecture. You had your choice. You could either run it on i386 or nothing. <laughs> that was the only choices you had. So the actual announcement for Linux, though, came from Linus uh, Torvalds himself. This was... Uh, in August of uh, August 25th in 1991, in which he was talking about, hey, I'm doing a, an operating system. It's just a hobby. It's not going to be big or professional like GNU. Uh, and it's going to be just for the 386. He didn't know if he was ever going to release anything other than that. <clears throat> he wanted some feedback, and man, did he get it. Uh, I don't know how many replies this one note uh, actually generated, but it was in the thousands. So it was, he was really going after those people that were running Minix. And Minix, of course, was a teaching uh, operating system that was developed by uh, Tannenbaum. And, uh, and there were some exchanges that occurred back and forth between Linus and Andrew Tannenbaum over the, uh, over the years, uh, particularly as to, you know, the suitability of one versus the other. But that's history, and that's neither here nor there. I'm not here to discuss old old things that had happened. But so the most current release of uh, 5.14 release candidate four was released in August the 8th of 2021. So <clears throat> it consists of a little over 70,000 files, over 29 million lines of source code, and it supports I th it's over 30 hardware uh, architectures. I think it's around 31 right now. Uh, that is actually in there. So, yeah, tr tremendous amount of support for Linux. Uh, so, yeah, we all kind of know that are in the community what Linux is, but Linux itself is just the kernel. It's just the operating system that's written primarily in C. Of course, there are other languages that are used in the kernel code, including Assembler or some Python and uh, so forth. So, yeah, there there is quite a few languages in there, but primarily it's in C. Uh, there's over 2,900 tokens that still exist in the most current versions of the Linux kernel that were in the original 1991. A lot of people, I, I've seen this uh, several times from uh, other Linux uh, community members that have said that all that code has been replaced. Uh-uh, no. <laughs> no, it's still around. <laughs> still some of that old stuff still running around. Um, but, you know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. That's kind of the mantra that we all do in software development, right? So if, you don't, if it isn't broken, don't go in and just try to fix it. Um, over half the Linux source code was written in the last eight years. So, I mean, that definitely proves to the testament of the activity that's inside of the Linux kernel development team. They are definitely busy. <clears throat> in 2015, the Linux Foundation Core Infrastructure Initiative Program 
introduced a best practices badge for open source, and they awarded, uh, and, and of course this is rating the quality of software development and they're rating their security practices. Uh, the Linux kernel team achieved the gold badge in 2020, so they have met the requirements of the Linux Foundation's uh, CII program. So um, we'll talk more about that at the end, however. So there was a maintainers list that was first appeared in 1996, uh, and it had three names in it. <laughs> it was about 172 lines. A lot of it was just, you know, informational and comments and stuff that was in there. Um, today, the maintainers list uh, contains over 19,000 lines and 1,500 maintainers. Now, I went out and looked at the most current. It's about 1726 or so as of today. So, yeah, it changes quite a bit. It'll, it'll vary up and down as people come and go and, and do commits for the current release. So the first version control was BitKeeper, and uh, that was introduced uh, in 2002. Before that, uh, I think they tracked the changes manually, and on they, they didn't really have a source code uh, control system, which as you grow in complexity and size and you add on maintainers, that becomes critical uh, because it allows you, it does three things. First, it allows you to roll back to an earlier version in the case that everything just goes completely to heck in a handbasket. Uh, the second thing it allows you to do is to maintain a backup of your code, uh, and that's as part of the ability to do version control. And then the third thing is it allows people to independently check code in and out while other people are actively doing development on the code without worry that, oh, I'm going to grab somebody's uh, source file and make changes to it while they are. We both save the file. One person's changes gets in. The other person's changes do not. So it maintains a lock, basically, on those files that are currently in use. So the version control moved to Git in 2005 from uh, Linux version 2.6.12.rc2. I don't know if that's important to you, but um, they did uh, recognize there were some shortcomings in BeatKeeper, and so they moved over to GitHub. Some, some interesting trivia that I found was the Linux kernel that it runs on a, that run that is running on a laptop uses about two million lines of uh, kernel code and about five thousand kernel files. These are not the files that are part of a distribution. These are just the files created by the kernel. So about five thousand files are in use. Now the interesting thing is that if you're running a Linux kernel and that can be Android because it is a Linux kernel. Uh, it's running on a cell phone. It uses about 3.2 million lines of kernel code and about 6,000 files. So it's why is that? Well, the differences have to do with the complexities of a SOC, a system on a chip, uh, in order to support it and keep it running. So yeah, it's just it's more complex and and so it takes more code to run it. But so if you think that your laptop is actually more complex than a cell phone, no, nope, it's not. So the number of lines of source code continues to increase. I mean, I don't think there's any surprises there. Uh, the number of files that the kernel uses also continues to increase. So in 2018, there were eight hardware architectures that were officially retired that were removed from the Linux kernel. And there was also about 1,800 plus lines of code that were removed and deprecated out of the Linux kernel. So... However, the amount of code being added back in <laughs> far exceeds that. So, yeah, that's why it continues to grow. So, from 2007 to 2019, there was, uh, now we talked about there's been over a million commits, but in that time frame, about 780,000 plus of them occurred. So, yeah, the activity has been occurring in the in the last 10 years or so, or even 20 years, so, or 15, I guess. So the Linux kernel team accepted commits from about 1,730 organizations. That's not maintainers. That's companies that are actively supporting, and that includes companies like Red Hat, IBM, Microsoft, Google, Amazon. Um, there's just a, and even Apple does provide some code support for the Linux kernel. Uh, believe it or not. So each year, over 400 organizations contribute to the Linux kernel source code. 
uh, and the, there is a cadence that occurs in order to develop a release cycle within uh, within the Linux kernel team. So they start, and for the first two weeks, that is just merging code into the baseline Linux uh, kernel. That's where they add new functionality. At some point, though, they will cut off the inclusion of new functionality and call it a release candidate. And so <clears throat> doesn't mean it's been fully tested. It just means that this is the cutoff for I'm not going to accept any new changes. You can do bug fixes and you can do updates to improve stability, but you cannot introduce new, new functionality. So that then is re referred to as an RC1. And that code cycle then moves the kernel code into testing, debugging, and stabilizing cycles. Uh, there is a weekly release candidate that's generated, and that continues until it reaches some target quality or stability factor that they have determined that they want for that particular kernel. Once that's done, <clears throat> a release is made from that release candidate, and the cycle begins again with the next uh, re the, with the next merge cycle. So <clears throat> it's a, it, the testing is a community effort. It isn't just the developers. It isn't just the organizations that contribute, but it's also you and I have the ability to go out and download the release candidates, install them, and start testing on them. So you can become a part of this if you wish to. There are some automation. There's some testing automation tools, and uh, there are several phases. The first is static analysis, which is provided by tools like Sparse, and that uh, semantic parsing that's looking for correctness of the code to make sure that you know it's not going to have syntax issues or or potential logic bombs that might be in there. <clears throat> Smatch allows it to match source code. And then uh, uh, CocaCheck uh, is the semantic patcher, so it allows things to get patched up. Though these code, these tools are really run to find particular bugs in the Linux kernel code. And then and there are automation test tools which kick in, called Hulk, Hulk Robot. There's some fuzzy testing that uses Trinity, and Linux system called Fuzzer, which tests the Linux calls within the uh, kernel to make sure that they're functioning correctly. These are all really a, to help try to find problems proactively before users get their hands on them and find the code problems themselves. Are is are the automation the only way that these occur? No, there's also us. We also do a lot of this testing as well. Once uh, the Linux kernel releases, uh, once they're satisfied with the tests, they'll classify it as a stable release. And they'll release those about once a week, approximately. Um, and then there are other. There's also other tests that are performed. Now, these are always done in the release candidate phase. So there's also kernel CI zero day, and, and of course the developers perform tests as well. And then there's a build bot that runs in order to create the kernel architecture executables for the 30 plus hardware architectures that Linux kernel depo the, can deploy on. Uh, and these builds are autom have automation testing in order to make sure that those different hardware builds are working. So there used to be the, the so there also used to be a long-term release. There still is. But long-term release back in the 419 days was two years. And the Linux uh, kernel team came under pressure to, hey, we need longer release cycles than this for our long-term releases. That's too fast. And that's true. I mean, a lot of times there are security accreditations. There's also operational accreditations that occur that will be invalidated the minute you change a major release of the uh, kernel. So, And you get to go and repeat all those tests again for the organization that you're operating inside of. So... Um, they, the uh, kernel team came up with something called the super long-term support uh, called SLTS, and that is, lasts for about six years. And, of course, there is still pressure being placed on the kernel development team to even extend that even longer. And recently, well, recently, about you know a few years back, 4.4 uh, and 4.9 were extended to 
to be a total of 12 years. So it is there isn't a cut and dried uh, equation that you could apply to this and say it's always going to be six years, it's always going to be 12 years. I mean, that's uh, it, it's the squeaky wheel gets the oil, right? So if the organizations are complaining and saying, hey, no, this is not going to work, we need to have this particular release cycle supported for a much longer time frame then they will normally get it if uh, you know if they need that. So that has been one of the contributing factors to the success of Linux in the server uh, in the server arenas because uh, there are just their accreditation cycles which in of themselves can be longer than the former LTS support cycle. So yeah, you get done all only to start again. <laughs> so uh some final thoughts. Uh, so this past week, the Google security team published a very worrisome article about the Linux kernel. Uh, and their report was is that major security flaws are creeping into the Linux kernel without being fixed or addressed. So they they had, I'll publish the, the URL for it. You can go read it. I, I'll probably do a separate video on that topic and bring it up. But they're their findings are this is significant there's a significant number of problems that are occurring in the kernel and they call out there's some faults in the testing process the methodology and the tools that are being used and also there's some faults also in the security practices that need to be corrected that's always going to be true i mean you can take any software project and the rule set that you put in place in one year is going to be invalidated by the next. I mean, that's going to happen. So is this something to be all alarmed about? Well, I mean, it is a concern, of course, as you're deploying newer and newer versions of the Linux kernel, uh, that you possibly could be introducing zero days into your organization. So, yes, it is, it is a concern, and it is a valid concern. So, and we definitely don't need those kinds of things. So, but the goal of the Linux kernel team is to maintain the common goal of having both a high quality operating system and no regressions, which is, uh, that's, I don't agree with that statement. I mean, I understand what they're saying there, but I don't agree with that. Your goal should be in maintaining a code base that is both secure and a quality release Having a no regression is, in, in my in my estimation, an insane policy, because what you're really saying is you don't care if those tests reveal an issue or not. You're going to release no matter what, and you're going to keep that release out. So I, yeah, I think that's a pretty insane methodology for a testing phase. So but that's an old-fashioned guy like myself that you know we do we had and have done regressions in the past based on things that we term as unacceptable risk or unacceptable bugs that we have rolled back. The Linux kernel team continues to introduce new tooling and the development of testing to improve the quality and security of the Linux kernel, and that's good. That's always going to be the case when you're working in something that is a mature software pr development uh, project, and you're going to be moving down that pipe, and where newer, where newer and newer ways of exploiting your system are discovered. And you need tools in order to counter those threats. Also, there will be additional rule sets that you will need in order to perform testing as you find bugs over time or as your users find bugs over time. So, I mean, all in all, uh, I think the Linux development, uh, kernel development team has done a great job over the past 30 years. And I hope they continue to produce a good quality, secure product going forward for the next 30 years. And congratulations, Linux. And Thank you for watching. Um, that's pretty much all I had for today. I uh, I will go probably will go back within the next week. I need time to go through it. It's a long article about where some of the vulnerabilities have been found by the Google team. So uh, anyway, I hope you enjoyed this today. If you did, please like and subscribe. And hope to see you all again real soon. And bye for now.